right, uh, so we just finished chapters 15 and 16 on heat and heat transfer. And now we get to start phase changes in thermodynamics with the next set of homework. You get more time with it, but um, you don't have to worry about if you're like going to play all spring break because you still get all the following week. It'll be due on the 24th, as, with, as Web of Science always tells you the due date. Um, so today will be 17, and the Monday we meet back will be 17, phase changes. And then the next two lectures after that will be thermodynamics. So that gets us to Monday the 26th. Seems so far away now. We'll review and have the uh, third exam on the 28th. 28th. Yeah. We just did 15 and 16. 17 and 18 is now posted. So you can work on it over spring break if desired. Realize uh, I will only have gone over half of one of the chapters, but that's what the book's for. But you can wait to submit until you're, but yeah, it's there for you to start thinking about and look at, definitely. And then after exam three, we'll do the uh, unit on electricity and magnetism. Twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, and twenty-five. So just four more. Electricity and magnet, part five, they call it. And G will be done. Keep sticking, don't you? <laughs> Any burning questions? Yeah, the superhero paper, I would like, uh, yeah, a hard copy and a digital. I assume however you type it up, you can email it, you can bring it in on a flash drive, I can transfer. It's just if we do that before or after and you all hit me, we won't have time, but um, I would think email is the easiest. So your personal yeah, or well, you can burn it on a little a CD, I, yeah, I don't care. Oh, to my email, you can just send it as an attachment to the email and the syllabus would be the ideal when you're sending attachments. I mean, I'll still get them. But I would prefer the email and the attachment is ideal, but I'm not going to limit because I know everybody's got different ways. But if you can't do that, you want to bring it in on a drive or a CD or post it online and let me download it, whatever. Just as long as you send me an email telling me that. So again, yeah, the superhero paper, that is one of the, in all those instructions. Since we're on it, read those again. That's how I'm going to grade you, so at least you know you're writing it correctly. There is a, a limit. How, how, it can't, how long it should be, as well as that I want it in both forms, electronic and written. You can turn it in any time up until that due date. After that due date, you have no excuse. You've had all semester. What? Oh, anybody remember off the top of your head? April. I'm hearing more for the second. It, it's uh, in the resources on WebAssign. Is, is, wait, I got the syllabus right here. But that, all those instructions are in the resources on WebAssign or was with the syllabus they handed out the first day if you were here. Paper, right, April 2nd, it's a Monday. So after that, um, you know, unless you were, oh, I came to turn it in and I got ran over. Uh, I don't know why you have an excuse. <laughs> Okay, got that. Oh, yeah. I got that. Homework number five. So that's the, oh, yeah, the iron block and the input in water. Yeah. So now you can go back and hit the key and see the solutions, too. So if what I'm saying doesn't make sense, but I'm right here, so let's do it. So we have... This is iron, and it's one kilogram. It's one kilogram, and its temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. And we're going to put that into a kilogram of water at, thank you, 20. 
We did in class one where uh, we mixed water. Let's start with that one. If uh, this was water and this was water and we got the same mass and we mix them, where do you think the temperature would end? In the middle, 30, which 30 is, yeah. That's because they're the same materials. They have the same specific heat capacity, the same thermal inertia. So they want to resist change as equally amount. So this guy's hotter, this guy's colder. Heat will flow in this direction. So this guy will cool, give up some of his energy, and this person will absorb it and gain it. So we, yeah, we expect it in between. But if they're the same amounts and they're the same material, they should do that symmetrically, equally. I and mean, they would end up as 30. These are not the same materials. We have the same amount. That helps. So we're just dealing with one thing at a time. But it's iron in water. Who has more thermal inertia? Water, which means its temperature wants to stay the same. Yeah, stay the same, change less. So it, it tries to meet in the middle, but this guy's not going to resist the change more than this guy. So it's going to end up closer to 20. So it would be less than 30, somewhere between 20 and 30. Does that help? Make sense? But, go ahead, that's why we're here. I was kind of thinking if you got a red hot piece of iron. Uh, red hot piece of iron. That was so hot it was warm. Okay. If you drop it in that water, it would continue to give off energy for a pretty long period of time. Not necessarily a long period of time, but a longer period of time. It would just set it hot. Absolutely. If it was a you know, glowing ember of iron, yeah, it, would have, it has more energy. It would be at a higher temperature. And yes, it would be able to give off more of its internal energy because it has more. And so it would do that for longer and the temperature of the water would get up to a higher, but this one would have to start higher too. It would still wouldn't end up in the middle. It would not. Would not. Even if this started at 100 C, let's say. Four, 500 C. It would not end up in the middle because lower specific heat, less resistance to temperature change and so his temperature is going to change at a greater rate than the water. And so he'll come further temperature-wise than the water does. And they won't meet in the middle. Uh, if they're the same masses, yeah. Yeah. Not if you're, yeah, this will never exceed the halfway point with iron if you're mixing it with something with a greater specific heat capacity. Yeah, and let's say we put butted this up to, and now I need to think of something that's lower. I don't know. Um, iron's pretty low. <laughs> well, steel mills at like 11, 1200 degrees, something like that. Okay. If, if it were 1,000 degrees. 1,000 degrees? Right, and you put the same quantity of water. Mm-hmm. It's still not going to exceed the halfway mark of temperature. No. It would not exceed the halfway. Same reasoning, because he, heat's flowing, but it's flowing uh, from here to there. So this one increases, that one decreases. But this one's going to decrease faster than this one increases. Because this can, it needs to absorb more energy to have the same temperature change. That's what specific heat capacity is. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's this chapter. If this is super hot, this might get up to 100, but then now energy is still re being come released from the iron, it's not going into changing its temperature. It would go into changing phase and converting it to steam, even helping us more not have this temperature come up as high, as fast. Yes? I'll try again then. Specific heat capacity, the little c, is thermal inertia. That's how I like to think of it. It's a, you, you, it's, it's a measure, it tells you how much heat you need to raise some, easy, water. One gram of water needs one calorie of energy to raise its temperature one Celsius degree. So it's based on how much it is, changing the temperature. It's how much heat you need to make it change its temperature, up or down. Thermal, thermal inertia, if it has more thermal inertia, more, a greater, larger specific heat capacity, then it's going to resist that change 
more, meaning it won't change as quickly. You need more energy in or out to have the same effect temperature-wise. Yes. Okay. Yes. It'll be the t yeah. If you put heat into this, it can go into increasing its internal energy as well as raising the temperature. That I, I assume makes sense to you. Well, to, to in order to raise one gram of water one Celsius degree, you need a calorie. To do one gram of iron one Celsius degree, you, you need a lot less than a calorie. So it, it changes faster the temperature for the same amount. Thermal inertia. Inertia is resistance to change. When you add heat to something or take it away, how does it want to change now? With temperature. So that change in temperature will be less. The more thermal inertia, the higher the greater the specific heat capacity. In general, are liquids always Is the specific heat of liquids generally higher than solids? Off the top of my head, I don't know. Processing. I don't know, really. I don't know. Because how I remember that is from years of cooking. If you try to boil a pot of water, you may, you may wait 15 minutes to get it boiled. It takes a maximum of two to get it hot. Yeah, macaroni and cheese burns a lot faster than water, yeah. Um, I want to say yes. I'm hesitant because I need to go look at a table first because I, I don't remember. I don't. Um, it would make sense to me, though, in that solids are more tightly joined. So it's like dominoes. Or if I got you up here and I won't do it, but <laughs> say we all stood in a line like this, hip to hip. It's like elbows locked. And then I pushed over here, it would transmit faster throughout. That's kind of like a solid. I'm, it's an analogy here. Because you apply heat, what is that? Fast moving molecules making collisions, which speeds this guy up, which bumps into this guy, which bumps into this guy. And if they're connected well, like more often in a solid, then that can transfer through more quickly. That's why, like, remember the wax rings on the metal rods? Metals are generally better conductors, and they're solids because they got the free electrons. Where liquids, though, aren't connected as well. That would be like us standing next to each other but not touching. Maybe there's a space. And so if I push, the first few might go, but I bet you wouldn't see the end people move because it kind of died out. So in general, it kind of takes longer for heat to transfer, conduct through a liquid, excuse me, than a solid. So in that sense, it would heat up quicker and have a lower specific heat capacity are that way. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm not positive, so I'm not going to be definitive. <laughs> we can look it up. Other questions? This is good. I'd hate for you to end this whole course and leave feeling confused. <laughs> OK. Well, this one, this chapter, I hope will be more of kind of a relief to you. You've all dealt with phase changes. Hopefully it seems more familiar, make more sense. We're going to start with evaporation. Let's do it. That's um, liquid to a gas. Gas to a liquid. We're going to go in between there. That's evaporation. Is this new to anybody? Well, we'll just understand a little bit why and the heat transfer behind it. I'm going to go back to my molecular motion demo. Remember my uh, moving particles here? We're going to create some. Give it some energy. Let's apply some heat. Guess it helps if you focus.
There we go. So right now, think of this as a liquid. You got these molecules loosely connected. And on the surface of the water, you see they're less bound. And occasionally, you see one kind of pop up with more energy. Remember, the temperature is the average translational kinetic. That doesn't mean some can have a whole lot more than others at any given moment. And if you add a little more heat, things that are at a higher temperature, more of them escape more often. That's if one of those does not return to the liquid, this is contained, then that's evaporation. Yes? So that's why steam can rise before water boils. Steam can rise before water boils, yeah. That's the uh, liquid converting to vapor. You know, it's one of these mo water molecules that escaped. Because he, he, at that moment, got more kinetic energy and was going fast enough to escape. And now he's in vapor form in the air as steam. And so the ones that, let's just crank up the heat a little. And you can see if I didn't have this lid on there, I'd have to pick them all up. That's why I'm not doing it. But anytime you see one hit the top, think of it as escaping. So what happens? You end up eventually with less liquid, right? You know, when your pot boils forever, eventually it all boils away. Where did it go? It all converted to vapor form, liquid to gas. And the ones that escape, what, what, who do they leave behind? Cooler ones. They have less energy. Yeah. So to go from a liquid to a gas takes energy. You've got to put energy into the liquid. It's, but the way to think of it, what's really happening is the ones with greater energy escape. They leave. They, they take their higher energy with them. So the gas has more internal energy, leaving the less energetic ones behind. It's a cooling effect for the liquid. So you, you know this. If you have water on your hand and you blow on it, or you, you're wet and you step out into the wind, you feel cold. Well, what's happening? The liquid, some of the energetic ones, when the wind blows, they pop out and they're free to escape leaving the less energetic ones behind on your, on your hand. And they go, oh, I'm cooler now. So where do they grab heat from you? Heat transfers from you, the hotter body, into the colder body, and you feel colder. That's evaporation. Does that make sense? The ones that are leaving are more energetic. It's like they take the some more energy with them, and the gas now has more energy. The ones left behind are the less energetic ones, yeah. They get colder than they were on average. So this would uh, evaporate very quickly. So the hotter something is, the more heat you apply, the more likely evaporation is. So the warmer the air, that can affect things, or the, yeah. Do you have another one? So, not to this yet. In your notes, put it takes energy to go that way. You've got to put energy into liquid to get it to gas. And you can think of it as it has a cooling effect. To remember that is what we just talked about. When you're wet and it evaporates off of you, that cools you because the, the, the higher energetic ones have left your system. That's how drinking birds work, partially. Gotta love drinking birds. Okay, who saw, who saw the, the Simpsons episode? Where he's in? Yes, yes, it's great. There's a watch now. The face is a drinking bird. I'm not sure if it's just moving continually or if it's like a hologram thing and as you tilt it, but it's got a, the whole face, it's got the numbers around, of course, you know, little marks, but the face is a drinking bird that's just doing this. I gotta get one, okay. So I set up two of them here, and has anybody been observing and noting a difference? The red one's going what? You're correct. 
Good scientists make observations, and that's what I want. I was hoping somebody would notice the red one is going more quickly. The way these work is the head is felt. So I've dipped the head in liquids to start. Well, it evaporates. That takes energy. The energy go, kind of goes away with the higher in energetic gas, leaving behind the less energetic ones on the head, which is a cooling effect. What do you think that does to the uh, molecules inside his head? Yeah, it can, cools them by conduction. And the pressure in his head then, if his head gets cooler, do you think the pressure in his head increases or decreases? It decreases. The greater pressure in his hiney uh, pushes the fluid, the colored fluid, up his neck because of a pressure difference, which all got created by evaporation. Once the fluid gets too high, his center of mass shifts and he tips. And then, of course, he, if you have a container, he can re-wet through capillary action, surface tension, keep his head wet to continually evaporate, and this seems to be a perpetual motion machine until the fluid runs out and it all evaporates away. So it's two different liquids. This one must be evaporating more quickly. So guesses of what I used? Alcohol. Yeah, isopropyl alcohol. Makes him go faster because it evaporates quicker than water. That could be fun if we used gasoline. And then go get the torch. <laughs> yeah. I could light him too, but I, I like him. But this is great because there's lots of concepts there. But it starts because of evaporation, which is a cooling effect. Drops the pressure. Now there's a pressure difference, pushing the fluid up. And how much? It gets taller, taller, taller. The higher up that gets, that's telling me there's a greater and greater pressure difference because it has to support that column of water. It's probably actually alcohol in there, but anyway. You get the idea. Um, save that one. Okay, condensation. That's the other direction. It's the opposite of evaporation. By symmetry, that releases energy. In order for that more energetic gas to convert back into a liquid, it's got to give up some energy. So you can think of it as having a warming effect. Um, if you think of those energetic particles, if they get near the surface of a liquid and they run into it, which is going to happen, if they got a lot of energy, maybe they bounce off. But if one, you know, occasionally, and if they slow down, they'll coalesce and they'll stick to the surface. Two water molecules stick to each other, surface tension. So if one comes in slow enough, it'll stick. And now it's, it's liquid. It's become part of the liquid. It gives off some energy. So the gas cools, but the liquid warms up. Uh, some examples. Um, shower. That's my favorite. Uh, you get out of the shower, and I, I tell my wife, don't open the doors. And if you've got to come in and use it, that's fine. But when you hear the water stop, give me a moment. Because <laughs> I don't want all the uh, water vapor in the room to escape. Why? Because it keeps me warmer <laughs> until I get my clothes on. So uh, why does it do it? There's a whole lot of vapor in the air. And when I step out, it can condense on me. And when that vapor converts back into liquid, it has to release some energy, and I absorb it and warm up. It can keep me warm if there's enough vapor there. So how about this thing of water? It's just sitting here. Is it evaporating? You sure? Or is it being condensed? Is it being condensed at all? Yeah, it's probably doing both right now. Uh, there's vapor in the air, and so if it runs into it, going slow, it could be condensing. But I'm sure it's evaporating well. That one seems to make more sense to us. But it's doing both. If evaporation's winning, what do we expect to happen? Eventually, this will be gone, yeah. And in Utah, that's probably the case. 
The humidity is very low. As my predecessor used to say, Utah is drier than a popcorn fart. <laughs> Where it's more humid, uh, yeah, there's less evaporation. Well, maybe there's the same, but the net effect is uh, less. Here, I expect to come back and this will be gone. And the equator would take longer. So, because it's evaporating and condensing at the same time. If there's more water vapor in the air, though, it's, it's more likely to condense. Because there's more to condense on it, just statistically. If that's happening, because it's really muggy, and it's what we could actually expect to have more water. We usually don't see that as often. Because <laughs> more water than this? <laughs> Probably not, but more than here. And so you have to watch out when you leave your bread out. It depends on where you live, how hard it gets or, or whether it gets moldy. It has to do with the, the gas in the room and the, the rates, the balance there between these two. If they're perfectly balanced, that should stay the same amount of water Forever. Yeah. So explain rain when it's not raining, but it's well humid. Raining while it's humid. The thing with that is with weather, the warmer the air is, warm, the more water vapor it can hold. Colder air can't hold as much. So in general, the warmer it is, there's more water vapor there to work with. So it's statistically more likely to condense out and rain. That's you know, okay, so fundamentally. Yeah, if you take that warm air and cool it, that's when it, it condenses out because it can't hold it anymore. And I see this. I sleep with a humidifier. Uh, so I just get dry. I grew up in Kansas where it's a whole lot more humid in here and I just haven't adapted yet. <laughs> but in the winter, my room's colder. So it never gets as humid in my bedroom. Because it just can't hold as much. It's the same humidifier that I can use in the middle of summer. But when the room's warmer, it can hold more. And I, I got a hygrometer on my wall because, you know, I'm a nerd. That, that measures humidity, relative humidity. And I can see that it actually will get higher when the temperature's warmer. Because it can hold more. You guys heard of a psychrometer? Nobody hardly uses them anymore, but it's two bulb uh, thermometers, and you put a little uh, fabric that, with some wicking action covering one of the bulbs. You dip it in water to get it wet. So now it's a wet bulb and a dry bulb. And if you sling it around like this, for, and I talk for about 30 seconds, what's happening? Yeah, the wet one's evaporating. So how do you expect that thermometer to compare to the dry bulb thermometer? Who thinks it'll be warmer? Who thinks it'll be colder? There we go, yeah. Because it's evaporating, which takes the more energetic particles away and leaves the less ones behind. Yeah, it's going to draw heat from the thermometer and the thermometer will cool. It's a cooling effect, evaporation. The other one isn't doing anything. So I should see a significant difference. And then you can look these up on a chart and get your uh, dew point, which is the temperature of the air at which it can't hold any more water. It's maxed out. Or the, the water will start coming out as rain. So let's just see, compare the differences here. You don't have to believe me, but the wet bulb is 12C, and this one is 20C. So there's a difference in 8 degrees Celsius between the wet and the dry. The wet being the cooler. So yeah, I could look that up on a chart now and figure out when it would rain. If the temperature dropped to a certain point, I knew it would rain because the water vapor would just come out and condense. Yeah? What is it? I don't know. I have the calculation. They usually look it on, up on this big scary looking chart. <laughs> Curvy and it's not linear. <laughs> but it's fun and it's that simple. Um, let's do this one. Got some pop cans here. Put some water in them. And we got some steam coming out, I think. Good, I waited long enough. Crank it up. What I'm going to do 
is take one of these, turn it upside down into this uh, of water. This of water, that was good. <laughs> what do you expect the, uh, I'm waiting for the steam to come out. It's displacing the air, and so it's mostly full of uh, water vapor, steam. What do you think will happen to the steam when I capsize it into the dish of water? Yeah, I expect it to condense. It's going to see the cooler water, and all that water vapor, when it hits it, is going to stick, become a liquid. It's going to condense, give up some energy. What do you think will happen to the pressure inside the can? It decreases. Think of it, it's full of steam, and a lot of that steam condenses into liquid, which takes up less space. So yeah, it's going to be less dense in there. Decrease the pressure of the can. What should the air in the room do? Here we go. It crushes. I'll let this one get even hotter. The atmospheric pressure of the air pushed in on it, where there was less pressure. And again, the less pressure was created by, uh, in this case, condensation. I think that's cool. I've done this with a 55-gallon drum. That's fun. I just don't like st storing all those. <laughs> yeah, in this case, going from gas to liquid, condensation. The gas, I like to think of it as releasing energy. Yes. Yeah, because if this is uh, exactly releasing energy, it's a warming effect for where the liquid goes, and vice versa with evaporation. The liquid's on you. The liquid ta takes energy to get it from there, and it kind of escapes with the gas, leaving this with less energy, and you cool. It's a cooling effect. Yeah, the, and I'll admit, if that confuses you, don't think of those, because this applies, like in this case, it's more specific to the liquid. When you're wet and it's, and, and it's evaporating off of you, it cools you. It's to help you remember that ah, as the gas that escapes, as evaporates away, is taking energy away with it. It's not cooling the gas that escapes. That's the more energetic ones. And so you, yeah, this does, you have to see which side it applies to. And the reverse over here. Let's do it again. Ready? Yeah, I gave it more time to have steam come out, yes. So there was a more condensation happen, greater drop in pressure, greater difference in pressure, more smush, imploding pop can. Simple enough to do, you can try it at home on your stove. Where did I put my paper here? Let's pour some liquid nitrogen into this pop can. And we'll watch it. Uh, so in case you're, you're wondering, um, I won't ask you much on this, but your textbook talks about it. Humidity is just a measure of how much water vapor is in the air. Because you've heard those terms. It's actually, the way they find it, the absolute humidity is, it's actually density. How much m mass of water vapor there is per volume of air. Mass over volume is absolute humidity. It's a measure of how much there is. Relative humidity is more useful to us, which is just a ratio of the absolute humidity to the maximum humidity. Meaning, okay, right now there's so much water vapor in the air, but it can hold this much. So it's, a, it's like a percentage. If it's 70% uh, humid, that means it's holding 70% of what it can at this temperature. It could hold 30% more water vapor. That's what relative humidity is. And we already discussed dew point, the temperature at which it can't hold anymore. It's saturated. You hear a lot of these terms in weather. Hopefully they make sense to you now. Uh, and that is how uh, clouds form. You guys should know this now. It's a multi-step process. 
Warm air rises because? Convection. It sets up convection. It's less dense. It's more energetic. It expands. And as it expands, do you think a temperature goes up or down? Down. It cools. And as it cools, what happens to the water molecules? That means they are, thought I heard a mumble over there. If it's colder, yeah, they slow down and they're more likely to coalesce when they run into each other. If they have a lot of energy, you know, you take two sticky balls and you, you throw them in really fast, they might bounce off. But if they're slowing down, they might, they're more likely to stick together. And so, yeah, they coalesce, they condense. And you start seeing a cloud. The water vapor in the air, yeah. Warm air rises. As it does so, it expands, which cools it, which slows down the water molecules. And we just said, when air cools, it's more likely to condense. The water vapor that's there is, is more readily available to coalesce and condense and start forming little water droplets that can build on each other. And you get clouds or fog. Fog is just a cloud on the ground. Uh, on, on a hill. If you have uh, our mountains, the air comes in. If it goes up, it's rising. There's less pressure up here. So it expands, cools. And where are you likely to form clouds? Uh, above mountains. So you can take, and uh, so it cools. It's, the air up here is generally colder than down here. The reverse is true too, though. If you've got cold air up here and it comes down, it warms up. You can feel a warm front in here. The reverse happens. It comes down. The pressure is greater here. That contracts it, compresses it. It's like me squishing the air in the pop bottle. And the temperature goes up. Things are more likely to evaporate because they've got more energy. So you can get cooling and warming effects that way. Boiling uh, is uh, another way to think of Evaporation. Evaporation is that the more energetic molecules leaving from the surface. Think of boiling as just evaporation underneath the surface. There's molecules down there, but if you keep applying heat, eventually they're moving fast enough, they want to separate even in the liquid itself. And they start forming bubbles. And the only way those bubbles can form is if the pressure, the vapor pressure, because it, it, some of it evaporates into gas, and that gas is trapped. If it can maintain itself, the bubble will get bigger lest it, and rise up, and that's boiling. What's it competing against? The vapor pressure. Atmospheric. Atmospheric pressure pushing down on the liquid itself, and the weight of the, weight of the liquid it's in in the first place, the water. Yeah, if it's at the, usually you know, on your stove, the, the heat's down here, and you got this much water. So all of that water is pushing on it too. So it has to overcome both of those pressures. And if it, ha it absorbs enough energy and they have a, they're moving around fast enough, they can create that, a large enough vapor pressure to make the bubble expand and you get boiling. But it's just evaporation, liquid going to gas underneath the surface. I think it's a cool way to think of it. Think of it. There's a good image in your book where they draw and you're applying your heat to your pot, you got a bubble. So the gas is pushing outward. The liquid's pushing in due to its pressure. And atmosphere is pushing down as well. So you can change the boiling point of something. Normally, it'll start boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. But here in Salt Lake, it boils a little less. The temperature's a little lower. Why? Yeah, this is smaller. There's less atmospheric pressure, and so it doesn't need as much vapor pressure in here to expand. So if we, we went even higher, it'd boil sooner at a lower temperature. Let, let, did you just hear somebody yell, help? <laughs> we'll see. Um, Let's say it boils at 90 degrees C. You're high enough up, it boils at 90 degrees C instead of 100. Will your food cook as quickly? No, because it's not as hot. It'll take longer to boil your uh, macaroni and cheese or your egg. It's still boiling, but at a lower temperature. 
Yes. So, would, would there be a difference between warming water in a tall skinny pot or a short fat pot? Absolutely. Yeah. A, a tall skinny pot versus a wide one. It's starting to boil down here, and that's like a geyser. This, there's more weight here, and if this is really tall, then that's increasing the pressure, and that raises the boiling temperature, the boiling point. It, won't, it can't start boiling until it's got more energy at a higher temperature. And if it's really skinny, you can't have convection. Remember that, my chimney that wouldn't go? Because it's trying to convect the warm air or warm liquid tries to rise and the cold air tries to come down, but if that's too skinny, you can't create a convective air flu uh, flu flow. And so this gets even hotter and hotter and hotter, and eventually this will start boiling. And what's in its way? This, and it pushes it out with it, and that's, that's a geyser. I, I, expect, I hope to set one up Monday when you guys get back. So we'll see a little tabletop version. So it won't boil more quickly, but when it does boil, it will be hotter. Yeah. When you increase the pressure, it takes more vapor, vapor pressure. It needs more energy, so it won't start boiling until a higher temperature. So increasing the pressure raises the boiling point, and decreasing the pressure lowers the boiling point. Boiling doesn't cook things. The temperature cooks things. The hotter something is, the faster it'll cook. Yeah? Yeah, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius if it's pure water and at sea level. So that's a yeah, standard atmospheric pressure at sea level only. Um, pressure cookers then. How do they work? They do what faster? Well, is your food, food done more quickly or slowly? More quickly. So let's work backwards. They cook faster. That must mean what about the temperature? Yeah, they get hotter. Well, wait, I thought water boils at 100 degrees C. It's preventing the boil until it gets to a higher temperature. If you increase this pressure by closing it off, then th these, this value can get big. That va the, this, the surface can evaporate and create a lot more gas in here. And as you fill that up, it becomes more dense and increases the pressure above because it's, it's, just, it's trapped, which then inhibits boiling from occurring down here until even more energy is put in. It allows the boiling point temperature to rise so it boils at a higher temperature. And temp now that it's at a higher temperature, it cooks your things more quickly. It's a great invention. As long as you have a release valve, and you make sure it's uh, working properly, otherwise you just created a bomb. I remember reading mine. My, I don't use it much. There's certain yeah f foods that aren't good to do in there. I remember reading that. I don't remember the answers yet, but I do remember you can't if you can't overfill it, because if they clog these things up, and I think. Beans are more likely to expand, get foamy, and it clogs up the uh, release valves, which then allows the pressure not to escape some of it, which just means you just created a bomb, and boom, you got beans all over your kitchen, as well as pot shrapnel. So, but yeah, you have to be careful how f you don't want to ever overfill them, and there's certain things uh, you don't want to put things in your water either when you're doing rice if it makes it all foamy. I remember that now too. Same reasoning. Let's boil water by lowering the pressure, shall we? This is, you see the steam coming out? You convinced it's boiling? While I do this, look at this can. What, what uh, process was that? Condensation, the water vapor in the room, when it ran into the very cold can, it slowed down and coalesced and condensed onto the can. And then it's, it's so cold, what did the, uh, then the liquid do? Froze into a solid, because it pulled even more energy out of it. So it condensed it and froze it. 
You can actually put liquid nitrogen in a pop can, wait, and you'll get liquid oxygen dripping off the bottom, which is paramagnetic. If you're putting a really strong magnet next to it, it'll attract weakly. But that's a different story. Okay. <laughs> so there we've got to see condensation and freezing. We'll do more with melting and freezing next time. So I'm going to seal this off, not leave it on the heat source or it'll explode. <laughs> All right, so we're sealed. It's full of water, blue water, and vapor, a whole lot of steam vapor in the top. I'm going to take my ice cubes and put it on top. What's that going to do to the, uh, the jar and the steam in the top? Yeah, look. I'm pulling, heat is transferring from the hot steam into the uh, cold uh, top. And it can, the steam then condenses back into liquid which lowers the pressure. I'm lowering the pressure up top. So that great vapor pressure, it's cooling, and as it cools, the, vape, the pressure drops, and it's able to boil. Because the, the water temperature, when I flipped it, was just below boiling. It was boiling here, take it off, it stops boiling, but it was close. So just by dropping the pressure a little bit with ice, you can get it to boil. Can you guys see it boiling on the rim there? See the, the motion anyway? If I pour some water over it, you can make it go a little faster. Bloop, bloop. You can see them bubbles starting down here. Well, I can anyway. <laughs> and that'll do that until it cools enough that the uh, pressure difference isn't great enough. Or the water temperature drops that it's not close enough to boiling for such a pressure difference to sustain itself. Turn that down. I think that's pretty neat. Do you guys have any questions? Does it take longer to get hot? Uh, no, the te it's still increasing its temperature. It's just when it, before when it got to 100, it would start boiling and the temperature wouldn't increase anymore. Okay. If you, you keep rising the temperature at like 100, oh, it's, I'm not going to boil now. I'm going to go to 101, 102, 103, 110. I don't know what it is. Oh, now I, I have enough to boil. and It'll start boiling there, but it's hotter. So it'll take longer to get boiling, but it'll be cooking faster because it's hotter. Will it take longer for it to get to 100 degrees? It probably. Is the rate of increase the same? Not exactly. The biggest thing that helps, though, is the fact you have a lid on it. And convection can't take the steam away. It stays in there. And that helps anything with a lid on heats up more quickly. That's the biggest factor. But the vapor pressure hinders the boiling, but not the temperature, because heat, this heat is still being applied. It goes into something, just not raising the temperature once it starts boiling. That's the end of this chapter. So, Well, I didn't do a clicker question, darn it. Oh, well. <laughs> Everybody that's still here, just pull your clicker out and hit something. I'll give you a point. <laughs> for staying this late. <laughs> Polling's open. If you want to pull your clicker out and hit something in the mirror, I'll give you a point.